But the idea just simply being that you don't come to the family table to partake of a family meal together unless you're in right relationship. Don't come grumpy to the table pretending like you're a family when you're not really a family. And if we're not careful, though, we can make this into a ritual where we think, oh, I need to do these steps to make God happy and to do communion Mm -hmm. correctly. Hey guys, my name is Troy and I am the creative director for Apologetics Canada. I also get the honor of being your facilitator for the upcoming Leadership Summit. So if you give me just a moment of your time, I got a couple of cool things I want to tell you about and why you got to come. The Leadership Summit exists to bring young Christian thought leaders from across the West Coast for a time of equipping and networking. This is an opportunity for young professionals and student leaders aged 19 to 30 to come, grow, and network together as they develop in their Christian leadership. And here's the beautiful thing about the Leadership Summit. You don't have to have a title. You don't need to just be a pastor. You don't need to just be a CEO. This is for anyone who wants to better understand how to be a leader in these times that we're currently facing. As I mentioned, leadership is for everyone, which means we're going to have a wide range of people that want to come, and they're going to come with a wide range of questions. So we wanted to do our part and make sure that we brought a dynamic group of speakers to engage with over the weekend. We'll be discussing topics like, what is a Christian thought leader and how do I become one? What are my leadership strengths and weaknesses? What is the relationship between a leader and a community? But let me show you where we're going to be staying. So the accommodations for the weekend are held at Sasquatch Mountain Resort, or otherwise known as the Green Giant, because it's just that. We are in a giant duplex, which means everything you see on that side is on the other side. We got a hot tub or hot tubs, ping pong tables. We got a beautiful open common area where you can play music, you can play board games, you can take a nap on the comfiest of couches. And when I tell you the beds are so comfortable, Your nap time is going to go crazy. You're going to love it. You're going to enjoy it. So come and get around like-minded individuals. Myself, the speakers, and the staff are super excited to meet you because honestly, we've all been at that point and are in different phases of our journey of leadership as well. But it requires an application. Sign up today because the spots are limited and they will fill up. And that's a good thing, but we want you to be a part of it. So make sure you head to ApologeticsCanada.com slash leadership dash summit today. And I hope to see you soon. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the AC Podcast. Steve here. I'm here today with my lovely colleagues, Andy and Wes. How are you guys doing? Living the dream, Steve. Good. Good to have you back, Steve. You're away for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an eventful couple weeks, but I'm back and glad to be back. Um, I know a lot of our listeners, they just want us to get right to the point. So let's get right to that. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about sacraments, but specifically, we're going to talk about communion. And we're going to explain some related terms as we go along. Um, But let's start with uh, a a couple of terms here. Uh, What do we mean by sacrament? Uh, and means of grace. Can I just throw this one to you, Wes? Uh, often when we talk about sacraments or ordinances, we hear this related term, means of grace. What do we mean by that? So the definition of sacrament is going to depend on which denomination you're part of. But ultimately, uh, for Protestants, there's the ones that were prescribed that we see in Scripture by Jesus. So that being baptism and the Lord's Supper. And the way that we talk about those are an ordinance in that it's a a Christian rite, which is associated with tangible elements, right? So you have the water in baptism, you have the bread and uh, the wine in, in the Lord's Supper. And the means of grace is a way that we are brought to the fellowship within the body of Christ in order to come together as the communion, as the body of Christ, and participate in something that is both a representation, but also has an aspect of a tangibleness in regards to how we think about our faith. So Mm -hmm. these are not magical things, but these are things that bring us together in a way that exemplifies 
And that's why the term means of grace is often used. These are things that God gives to us to help us be part of the fellowship of believers that identifies um, and has been filled with the Holy Spirit as Christians. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think one thing, though, we've got to note here is, and we'll get into this more, how different denominations communion baptism has been practiced differently. And Mm. one thing that I'm always cautious about is that when we're talking about things like means or channels of grace, that we've got to be careful that, Wes, I totally agree with how you're defining that, but we need to appreciate that others would define that differently. Uh, the Catholics would have more of an understanding of grace being imputed sort of mm-hmm. idea, whereas the evangelical tradition is going to be more of idea of like sacred significance uh, sort of sort of idea of how how we're parsing that 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 term out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that there's an aspect that is kind of beyond what we can understand as finite human beings. I mean, the the word we get. Uh, sacrament from sacramentum in Latin in the Greek Bible is mysterion, right? It's a mystery. And so there's an aspect of, you know, we can understand that these things have an aspect of approachability and that Jesus tells us, you know, this is my body, this is uh, my blood and to come and do this in remembrance of me um, or that we need to be baptized uh, as that you know, symbol of the remission of our sins, but that there's a mystery to it, that there's something beyond. And I think that's where a lot of the disagreements historically within, say, Protestant Orthodox and uh, Roman Catholic come from is kind of parsing out, okay, how do we understand and parse out the complexities of that mystery? Um, Since we mentioned, you know, both of you mentioned different denominations. And I think it might be helpful for our listeners to know where it is that we come from too, because between the four of us, the quad, you know, we, we all represent different, we belong to different denominations. So why don't I'll start, like I grew up in the Roman Catholic church. um, And of course, Roman Catholics, we'll talk about this, but Roman Catholics have a particular understanding of uh, the Lord's supper or communion. And then I, later joined a Protestant evangelical church. Now I find myself attending an Anglican uh, church. Uh, So I belong to the Anglican tradition where we don't really have a set view on communion. It's kind of an open question, Um, but that's where I sit right now. What about... Let me just ask you a question about that, though, Steve, before before we move on. When you say that it's an open question, there are distinct practices within the Anglican church. Uh, Yeah. From what I understand, as an example, what I've seen is that communion is is partaken from a communal cup, that everybody's mm-hmm. coming and drinking from the same cup, and that it's being wiped uh, each time. Would that be right? So that that also depends. I mean, even within the Anglican Church, the practices differ. So there is a communal cup, but then we also have little cups like you would find in the Protestant evangelical church. But I think that's more uh, a case of, you know, what are you comfortable with rather than any particular theological significance as far as using the cups go, like not the communal cup, but those individual cups. Uh, Because some people just uh, have a, they're very uncomfortable with, you know, putting your lips to something that other people have put their lips to. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I grew up Baptist but uh, we were actually um, part of the the Anglican Church when we were overseas for a bit. So my um, when we were in Jordan and my parents were working there, we were part of the Anglican Church. And, but I grew up in a, a particular wing of the Canadian Baptist, and I've actually shifted in that I'm part of a different Baptist denomination. I'm still a Baptist, but part of a different Baptist denomination now than the one I grew up in. And I I would actually describe myself as far more sacramental in the way that I operate, and I think our church operates, than I would have grown up with. I would have grown up with far more of a representational view of the sacraments, and now I think I hold more of a more traditionally Protestant view of, of, which is a slightly high more sacramentology, not not unlike an Anglican would hold, or maybe even a Lutheran, um, but uh, my convictions 
historically are thoroughly baptistic in that sense but i when it comes to this conversation have actually progressed in the sense of my perspectives have have become more high church in one regard than uh, i think is probably typical for your average canadian baptist well this will make for a fun conversation because i'm on the complete opposite spectrum of that so when my mom first started going to church, she took us kids to a Baptist church in which I found it very odd that this plate was being passed around with these tiny little cups with this delicious juice. And I was like, man, I want more of that juice. Why is the cup so small? And, you know, these little <laughs> these little crackers. And it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I'd say when I got older, it was kind of more of this, you know, more of this idea of, of you know, communion being this this special time to really take stock of your life and the decisions you're making in your life. Then uh, I I pastored in some Baptist churches, but I also pastored in Mennonite Brethren Church as well. And I would say that communion was, or Eucharist, was more or less uh, practiced the same. By the way, if you hear that word Eucharist, it just means Thanksgiving in Greek. And that that. On that note, and I think it actually is a good point in that I've leaned, I've, I've moved more and more west in the opposite direction of you, uh, more into the representational and more into this idea of, well, what does it mean? What does Thanksgiving mean? So it, this is kind of an interesting point for me, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about this subject because I've been given this so much thought lately in that I participate in communion in churches, but I, by and large, don't love the way that we celebrate communion, uh, to be totally frank, where we're passing around these little cups and these little crackers. And yeah. and my fear is, and this is why I think it's so important that we talk about it, my fear is, is that communion just becomes this practice that loses its significance to the ritual. I, I do remember having that conversation with you, Andy, when I was on the road with you uh, last time you were thinking about you know uh, by the way but before we move on maybe we should just clarify uh our viewers and listeners might have heard us mention a number of different terms uh eucharist communion the lord's supper these are all more or less interchangeable terms uh, that refer to the same thing not more or less they are interchangeable terms yeah <laughs> yeah they're, but, synonyms. Uh, com they're, they're coming back to you andy um you you mentioned something that really kind of really remained with me that it should be more of a this kind of eucharist or the lord's supper should really be more of a family meal help us understand that a little bit more yeah, hey thanks for throwing me that softball steve i appreciate that <laughs> uh because this is, this is an issue that I've given, like I said, I've given so much thought to because I've pastored for so many years and I have led congregations in communion so many times. So I guess in that sense, I've had to be forced to think about it. And, you know, there's, there's really only two main passages that we read from when we're doing communion. Four passages really in total, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, we we have you know Matthew twenty six, Mark fourteen, Luke twenty two, and then of course the uh, the other one. If you're not going to do one of the Gospels where Jesus is leading people through the the Lord's table, communion, Eucharist, whatever, uh, you'll have First Corinthians uh, eleven where the Apostle Paul is doing that. Now this is where I've given it so much thought is over the years as I'm reading these as I'm preparing to lead people through communion, I'm thinking to myself, this is all about a meal together. It's all about family. The context of the Apostle Paul is particularly about family. He's actually annoyed with the, the church in Corinth that the way they're having dinner together, the way they're celebrating communion, and that he, you know, he's, he's trying to c correct them in how to do that in a way that would be honoring to one another, in a way that would be honoring to God. And of course, Jesus is taking the Passover meal and he's giving it a new or what I would say fulfilled uh, interpretation, like that this Passover meal has is now being fulfilled in Jesus, this deeper significance. And really going back to what you're saying, Wes, the mystery is now 
being fulfilled in Jesus and, and we're left with this profound understanding of what Jesus has done for us. And, and this is where I get concerned. And that is that one of the things Jesus talks so much about is that we have been adopted into the family of God, that we come together around the family table uh, to, to share a meal together, like, like they would do with Passover. But now Jesus is giving this a significance in the adoption into the family of God that's going to come through him, that now we can come to the, to the, this table together. And, and let me just put a bow on it with this as I, as I pass this back to you guys, as you, you know, we're, as we're talking about this, because so often in our churches, we will say to people before they take communion, listen, if there's something in your life, if you have a grievance against a, uh, a brother or sister in Christ, you make sure you get that right before you partake of communion. And, and I just feel like so many Christians don't understand what we mean by that. And we're getting that, of course, from the Apostle Paul, and again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But the idea just simply being that you don't come to the family table to partake of a family meal together, unless you're in right relationship. Don't come grumpy to the table pretending like you're a family when you're not really a family. And if we're not careful, though, we can make this into a ritual where we think, oh, I need to do these steps to make God happy and to do communion mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah, it, you know, I, I really resonate with what you're saying there, because like I mentioned earlier, when I was growing up Roman Catholic, not that, you know, my life as a Roman Catholic was representative of all Catholics, far from that. But I certainly did go into that mindset because in the Catholic Church, the sacraments, uh, the seven sacraments, in- including uh, the, the Eucharist, it, the communion is so important, right? That's like the highlight of every Mass, right? Is that you're partaking of Christ's literal body and blood. Like, this is a big deal, right? You're in, in union with, with Christ. Um, but I did think it, it was almost like, because that is the highlight, that's all you wanted, and and everything else takes a, a kind of a back seat, even though and, and again this is just my story. I'm not saying that this is the official Catholic, reflective of the official Catholic teaching or how Catholics generally live. But I got into that mindset of I just need to do that, and so that's why I went to confessionals, right? The the, the reason I went to confessional was because well, as a Catholic, I need to make sure that I'm not in a state of mortal sin before I take communion. And so everything was geared towards that. I wanted to do that ritual because that was the highlight, forgetting that this is a family meal. Let, let me just put a, a highlight on that, just because there might be a little bit of confusion for people listening. For a Roman Catholic, you have to do two things to be able to partake in communion, if I understand correctly, Steve. The mm-hmm. first is, is you can't be in a state of a mortal sin. Yeah, They have a list of what these are, if you're wondering. They're basically the Ten Commandments, and then underneath underneath each of these, they have subcategories where they'll just really right. parse it out of what is uh, a mortal sin. Now, this is a, a mortal sin being that you are in danger of damnation, uh, of not making it to heaven. So you, you got to deal with that mortal sin by going to a confessional so that then you're in right standing so you could take communion. And then the second one is you can't, you need to have participated in a fast. Uh, for Roman Catholics, I believe it's an hour. You can't eat for an hour before you take communion. Yeah, there there were a number of different things like, you know, it, it's different. So every Friday you abstain from meat. Fish is okay. Um, you know, during Lent you abstain from meat. You know that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you you go to confessional and then you have to do penance, right? And just to kind of connect again to what you were saying earlier, I was forgetting the fact that this was a family meal, so. I just, so what really needed to happen was, you know, sure, you know, I can go to confessional. I I have something against my brother. Really what I should have done is after the confessional, I needed to go and reconcile with that brother first and then come and take communion, right? But that was sort of kind of out of my frame of whatever I thought was acceptable. So I just wanted to get to that ritual, <laughs> So again, this is just my story, right? But yeah, I, I, it really stuck with me when you mentioned on that road trip, uh, yeah, this this should be a family meal. And and I resonated with that so much. And I don't think that that negates like 
the reality of maybe a what we're describing as a, a higher church kind of perspective. I would agree fully that this is a family meal. And actually, one of the things we say, because I've led communion at my own church, because I'm on, I'm on leadership as a lay elder here, um, and I even a couple of weeks ago uh, led communion. And so one of the things that we we specifically say when we're doing it, we usually do a, a corporate confession, um, and it's usually taken from uh, the uh, the Book of Common Prayer. And we, as a church, we say, you know, a, a, a confession of our sin uh, corporately. And so there's an aspect of that. And then we say that, you know, this is a family meal. And so specifically, if you're here and you're not within the family of Christ, we're so glad you're here. We want to talk to you more about that. Mm -hmm. But that this is for people who have found their identity in Christ and are part of that specific family. And so we would simply ask that people who are, are not in that family to not participate for that reason and really stipulate uh, we talk a lot in our church about the reason why we're doing this i think for the reason that you've you've highlighted andy because while ritual has its place and its purpose right we talked a couple of weeks ago about um you know the the sacrifices in the old testament um ritual has a place and the judeo-christian faith is thoroughly ritualistic in many of its its kind of practices but they're not rituals for ritual's sake. And it's when they become something in and of themselves without attaching the meaning and the purpose and the identity. Like we see in the Old Testament, when the Israelites are sacrificing things and they've lost the purpose in it. And God says, hey, I hate this. <laughs> like, I don't want this. <laughs> um, even though those are things that he's prescribed, right? He's like, I don't, want your, I don't want your feasts. I don't want your new moon celebrations. I don't want your Sabbaths. All of these things are detestable to me. It's because there's a there's a very specific intention and meaning behind that. And I think that doubles for the new covenant symbols, the new covenant rituals, which is, you know, the sacraments that we're talking about right now. And it's vitally important that we make sure people know that this isn't just about coming and doing this thing to tick off the box, to appease God or to please God or whatever, to make sure you're, uh, you know, you're... Uh, on the right path in that regard, but that this actually should have meaning. And it's a little picture of the marriage supper of the lamb that happens in revelation. These are just little pictures of ultimately what we want to look forward to as Christians. Now, you know, as we're just kind of talking about this and processing it, you know, cause I, I can sense even in myself that I'm still working this out in my own theology of how I understand communion and how it should be practiced or how I think it should be best practiced. And it's interesting because I agree with you, Wes. I think there's times where ritual is good and can draw us into that deeper mystery and meaning of communion. But there's also so many dangers in it. And I, even in the evangelical tradition, I think there are a lot of people that kind of have this fear, especially those of us who lead communion, that, oh man, I better make sure that somebody doesn't take communion in the wrong way. You know, because... The, you know, the Roman Catholics might have their mortal sin thing. Well, us evangelicals have our own little views of mortal sin. Like, oh man, don't, don't partake communion unless you're, you know, a part of the family or, you know, you're going to get you know, struck down or something. You know, we have some kind of weird ideas because sometimes we can kind of have this over ritualize or tend to put some sort of, you know, magical view on this where I would say the danger, by the way, of somebody partaking in communion and they're, they're not a part of the family of God is you might be misleading somebody in thinking that they're a part of the family of God when they're not right. a part of the family of God. Yeah. More than, you know, some sort of magic at play, <laughs> uh, at play here sort of idea. Now I want to just, here's one of my concerns, by the way, with the ritual though. One of my concerns with say the Roman Catholics, that's a high bar for somebody just coming off the street, somebody coming into a church that is a really high bar to like, if you've ever been to a Roman Catholic service and I've been to a number of them, you, I'd never have felt welcome. I have never felt welcome. And, and I would say that because I don't know the rituals. I don't know the hoops that I have to jump through in the right kinds of ways so that I can be a part of that family. And I also think though, that there's other churches where there perhaps isn't enough hoops or you, there isn't enough structure that's been put in place. And I could give some examples of that, but is that making sense to you guys? That's the, that's one of the concerns I have. 
Yeah, although in their defense, if you're not a Roman Catholic, you shouldn't be participating anyways. And well, that's the way that they would But that's it. my point. That's my point. By the way, mm-hmm. if you're wondering about this, because I've had this unfortunate uh, experience. When I, was very, when I was young, when I was in my 20s, I went to a Roman Catholic church when I was abroad. And I tried to partake in communion with them. And because I didn't do things in the right kinds of ways, they knew mm-hmm. immediately that I wasn't Roman Catholic. And they were like, yeah. get out of here. We're not, we're not giving you communion. But that, but that's my point, Wes, is it's never explained to you from my times. I've never had it explained to me even how you would go about being eligible to partake in this ceremony that really I, I, I wouldn't even have understood uh, from their perspective. Am I making sense there? Like, because that's my concern is yeah, how do you, you then you know, find that, out that, how you can be a part of this? That, that's a good point. So. Uh, in our church, one of the things, so in the Anglican communion, some churches have what they call a closed table. Others have an open table. And what that means is if you have an open table, so we have an open table. And this is what our uh, priest and pastor will say, right? They'll, he'll always explain before uh, the service of the table begins, which means now this is the part where we, you know, go through the prayers and we receive communion and so on and so forth. So he always explains, we have an open table, which means if you have been baptized in the name of the father, the son and the Holy spirit, you can come up and then he'll tell you exactly what to do. You know, when you come up, put your hands together like this and a wafer will, will be placed there. And if you need to eat gluten free, you know, we even have that on the side. And, and so he'll explain all of that. And he'll also say, uh, you know, and if you, for whatever reason, uh, don't want to partake in this and just want to receive a blessing, just cross your arms as you come up and we'll pray a blessing over you. And so that uh, I've really appreciated that that explanation, because I'm thinking if I'm just a brand new guy, you know, one of the stories that you told me, Andy, that uh, again, Andy tells many stories. If you ever go on a road trip with him and, it's, and some uh, of them are even true, memorable. isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking about the Scotland story, Steve? Yeah. Why don't you tell us about that? Because that really um, had an impact on me as I was listening. Uh, just when I was in Scotland doing PhD work, one day I wanted to go to church. It was on a Sunday. And so I walked to this church, but it wasn't clear to me what door to go through. It wasn't clear to me whether or not I was at the right time, whether or not I was welcome. And it was just funny for me being somebody who had been pastoring for so long. I came to the the church. I held on to the church door. I just was not sure if I was welcome. And I ended up walking away that day. I didn't, I didn't go to church. And that hit me. What's that? Yeah. Cause I mean, you don't want to like, it's not even on the one hand, you're not sure. Am I welcome? But on the other hand, you're probably also thinking, I don't want to disrupt anything if there's something going on in here that I shouldn't barge into, right? Uh, Because you you want to be respectful to that as well. So I think you had a lot of emotions kind of crisscross all at once. Well, let me contextualize that in communion then. Maybe you guys would disagree with this, Mm -hmm. but I think communion is a great opportunity to invite somebody to the family of God. What a great opportunity to invite somebody to make a decision for Jesus. And that if you explain what it is and say, this could be a moment for you come and be a part of the family. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's what we try to do in the sense that if we say, you know, if you're here today, but you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, we're so glad you're here, but this meal is only for those who have new life in Jesus and are forgiven and have committed their lives to follow and obey Jesus. And we want that for you. We want you to ultimately be able to come up and participate. But, and then, you know, if you have committed your life to, follow Jesus. If you are a believer, you know, come eat that kind of thing. Uh, But I think it is important to make sure that people know, because I don't think people should be confused. I don't think people should be coming up and thinking, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing this or I don't like, that's not fair to them. Yeah, exactly. It's not. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, and and that's where there's a danger in over ritualizing things. And there's a danger in, in making something Um, so simplistic. I remember during COVID, there was a particular church live stream that someone sent me where uh, they were literally like, well, we haven't done communion in a while. So, you know, just grab a Dorito or some Mountain Dew. And, and, and we're joking about this. (laughs) No, that's, that's not okay. (laughs) Like they're, 
there's a, a level of downplaying it that's just sacrilegious in a way that I don't think is giving the honor when you read scripture and Paul is like, hey, be careful with this. Like there are caveats to that. But I think if if Paul could hear a, a pastor say, you know, grab a Dorito and some Mountain Dew and participate in the Lord's Supper with us, he'd be like, uh-uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. There's a line and I think you've crossed it. But I think that and, is an important note, Andy, is that um, I think it's really, and there are different levels, like you were saying, uh, Steve, to an open and a closed table. We have a, an open table, but we fence the table in that sense, in that we say like, hey, if you're not a believer, uh, please don't do this. You know, we want this for you, but this there's a reason why we're doing this. Um, and actually, we specifically say, you know, if children who aren't baptized, we would also ask that you just refrain um, from giving this to them as well. You know, those kind of safeguards so that it's clear, okay, what is this? This is important. It's not magic, but there's something to this. Yeah, and, and that's why um, it, throughout church history, the order of things has been that you first get baptized because that was the sign that you are now part of the church. And then you get, so uh, me growing up in the Catholic church, um, I, I almost did this like back to back. So I was baptized on a Saturday and then I received my first communion, which by the way, in, in the Catholic church is a big deal, right? Now, this is, again, this is the highlight of the mass is to receive communion. And so, the first time you do that, it's a big deal. So I did it kind of back to back, but there is an order to that. And the order is supposed to tell you that you, this is, again, this is a family meal. You first become part of that, the family of God through Jesus Christ. And then you partake in this meal together as a family. So now I, I want to take a, well, as we continue the conversation, I should say, I think it would be remiss if we didn't mention the different views on the Lord's table or Eucharist, because there are a number of views that are very um, typical. That you, you walk into any church, you will find one of these views represented around communion. So, Andy, can I toss this one over to you? What are some major views on this? Yeah, let let me share some some views that I've collected over the years as I've encountered various people. Uh, and and have asked them, you know, how communion is is participated in their their tradition. Uh, obviously, some I uh, agree with, some I disagree with, and some are, I think, just a, a little peculiar. You you might say. Let's start with the Jehovah's Witnesses as an example. Now, of course, I wouldn't put the Jehovah's Witnesses into the camp of evangelical or uh, Orthodox or anything of that sort. I would put them the the or context of a, of a cult. What was that? <laughs> or Christian? <laughs> yeah, or Christian. Uh, but it's helpful to appreciate what's going on there because I've had so many Jehovah's Witness friends that have come to faith and communion to them is a huge deal because in their tradition, only the 144,000 elect, they're the only ones that are allowed to partake in communion within the Jehovah's Witness tradition. From what I've been told, they'll celebrate communion once a year. They'll have the communion elements that will get passed around the church. And they'll all watch each other. No one partakes of it, of it unless they're of the 144,000. How do you know if you're a part of the 144,000? I guess you just know. And you can, you like get to the, you would just take it. But what I was told is there's a lot of social pressure put on you to not just go and take it and think you're part of the 144,000. I can see, Wes, you have you have something you want to say here. The, if If you are considered part of the 144,000 it's like it's a it's a position it's like an official position you have to be part of the like high up in the watchtower tract and bible society because it's 144,000 from the day of pentecost till the end times so it's a select select few people so it's yeah, so not your church like might not many churches don't have anybody that are taking oh no no community. i think most i think yeah. most of the kingdom halls won't have anybody that take it and um, like if any of us walked in and we took it, they wouldn't confuse us with uh, someone who was genuinely yeah. considered the 144,000. These would be people who would be known and it would be recognized as such that they were part of this particular group. So it's not just like anybody can feel that they are part of it and take it. 
if you are a JW, that would be incredibly inappropriate. And I'm pretty sure there would be like disciplinary actions. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a select, select few that everybody would know who they are if they were considered part of that group. But it does, but it does highlight the fact that for Jehovah's Witnesses, this is such a, an, an impossible task for an, for an ordinary Jehovah's Witness, right? Because you have to have built up so much sort of merit before you even come. To well, you'd have to be one of the lucky ones and yeah. one of the elect. And it's interesting because my friend Matthew, who came to faith through the Jehovah's Witnesses, I remember, I'll never forget him telling me about the time that he took communion for the first time. That he was in his bedroom, he was by himself, he couldn't bring himself to partake of communion in a church. It was just too significant, and he was just there weeping before the Lord, taking communion, realizing that God did love him, that God had chosen him, that he was a part of the family of God. And man, that, that always just blew me away, because I was like, we can just take it so flippantly, and I'll tell you what, after, after mm -hmm. hearing him talk me through that and his experience, I, I was like, I, I never, I never saw communion the same after that. Just the significance of, of being adopted in the family of God. Take the Mormons as an example. Again, these I would not consider Christians. This is another cult, but I think it's important to appreciate how they take communion. Uh, they they only have they take bread and water. Uh, so of course, no, no wine, no caffeine, <laughs> no no Pepsi. Uh, bread and water, and they do it every Sunday. Now, let's get into some kind of others that get kind of interesting here uh, outside of the cults. Take the Salvation Army. They're unique. They don't participate in mm -hmm. neither communion nor baptism. Uh, and I think we could circle back on that and talk about that. I've got uh, significant issues with that. Grace Brethren is a unique one. I don't know if you guys have come across this uh, denomination, but when they participate in communion, they also participate in foot washing. And so those two go hand in hand. So they tend not to participate in it very often because of the complexities of washing a whole bunch of people's feet. And that one's intriguing to me, though, because I do find it fascinating how some traditions want to take things very literally, but they'll leave out the fact that when Jesus did communion with his 12 disciples, he first washed their feet. And so this denomination says, okay, if Jesus washed feet before communion, we're going to wash feet before communion. The Ukrainian Greek uh, Catholic church uh, communion has to have yeast in it and is mixed with wine and it's served on a spoon and the wine can have nothing added to it. Now this is in contrast to the Episcopal church where communion must have gluten. And this is, this is like a, a significant part of their, their doctrine. I have a good friend of mine who's a part of this tradition. He and I agree about just about everything theologically, but he is resolute on this point that communion must have uh, gluten in it. So gluten-free options is not, uh, is not acceptable. Uh, and it must be wine. Can't be juice, can't be any, anything else. It has to be wine. Have you guys come across this, though, where people are just like different denominations are just resolute on on this? That That's a first time for me. Like, I'd never heard that before. Not with bread. Um, I, I've heard various theological arguments for actual wine as opposed to, say, grape juice. But I haven't encountered any stipulations based on bread. I, I would encourage you with your friends that are in these different denominations, just start asking. Because I've been on this track for a while, thinking through this, I ask quite a bit of people on this, and this is this has kind of really shocked me. Now, the Roman Catholics are interesting, as we've already talked about, because you got to you need to confess your sins. But more than that, they have a unique view that maybe one of you could just talk about, and that's the difference between consubstantiation and transubstantiation. So maybe it'd be good just to uh, to talk about that view of, mm -hmm. of communion. Yeah, I mean, transubstantiation is a philosophical explanation that comes into the form that's practiced now by Roman Catholics in the Middle Ages, so the 13th century, regarding how Jesus is present. And so what it argues is that the body and the blood, when being consecrated by a priest, supernaturally turns into the actual body and blood of Christ, then and there. So there are 
echoes of it prior to the 13th century, but it's really Thomas Aquinas drawing from views developing from Aristotle who develops the final form and understanding of the substance and accidents. Those are the kind of two terms that you'll hear if you uh, engage in, uh, say, a, a Roman Catholic theologian or in their literature. Those are the ways that transubstantiation is understood. And that was true during the Reformational era, and there was a big debate in regards to the differences, you know, when the Protestant reformers pushed back on these ideas. But it's basically how it operates today. And that was not always how it, it kind of was articulated. There was a lot of disagreements. In fact, this idea of, and we can talk about this more, real presence, because I think Protestants, historical Protestants, do believe in real presence. I believe in real presence but in a very different way than a Roman Catholic would believe in a real presence. And you actually do get that in Roman Catholic history. There were debates in the ninth century with um, individuals like Rad Radbertus and Atramnus about figurative versus uh, the actual body and blood becoming the body and blood. So, but all that to say, the idea that Roman Catholics participated in today, the philosophical explanation of what's going on, uh, it develops into its final form in the 13th century. Yeah, and the typical uh, explanation that you'll hear from a lot of Roman Catholics is, well, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And so they take that very seriously, which I find really interesting. So when I come across, you know, certain Protestant evangelicals who are very dogmatic about, you know, the literal reading of the Bible, I sometimes want to ask them, "Are you? do you believe in transubstantiation then? I guess we we can become a little bit selective in what we take literally and what not, right? But anyway, that, that is a typical uh, thing that you'll hear from a lot of Roman Catholics. Jesus, this is what Jesus said. And the I, I remember, just a quick, quick story, I grew up, uh, I was an altar boy at some point. Um, and I remember during, uh, during communion, you always you'll I, I don't know I, I i've been out of a catholic church for a long time so i don't know if they still do the same thing but i remember um every time whenever the priest you know raised the wafer or raised the cup you ring this bell whether it's a chime or you know you have a bell that you strike and that signifies the moment when these elements turn into in substance literal body and blood of jesus and so I had very much uh, this fear of actually biting into the elements because I was actually told not to, because this is the literal, to let it dissolve in your mouth kind of a thing. Um, and then I found out later, like there's this Catholic church down the road from here and they're like, Oh, it, it must be a Korean thing. Cause we bite into it all the time. So um, I don't know if it's a Catholic thing or a Korean thing, but anyway, that's the kind of the feel. I just wanted to kind of give you a feel of how seriously this is taken by Catholics. I'll give you my own little uh, story about this as well. I once was talking with a priest, a Roman Catholic priest, on this question. I won't give you the backstory. It was an interesting backstory, though. Trust me on that. Uh, but he, we were in this conversation, and I asked him uh, a question I think maybe a lot of people are thinking, and that is, well, can we test it? Can we if you hit a bell and it turns into the blood and flesh of Jesus, can we go and do an experiment on that and see if it's blood and if it's flesh? Now, this particular priest, Steve, he would have differed on this. He would say that once you've eaten the bread and drank the, the, the juice, then inside of you, it becomes mm -hmm. the, the blood and body. Now, my, so I asked him, I posed this question. Can we test this? And he said, well, no, you can't test it because as soon as you test it, it would turn back to bread and to wine. And so I said, okay, so if I eat it, it turns into flesh and blood. Yes. But then if we were to say pump my stomach or probe my stomach or whatever to test it, I said, then it would go back into bread and, and wine. And he's like, in, in his answer was yes. So in other words, then to me, this gets outside of the area of mystery as we've talked about. Uh, Wes. And now I see this getting into just superstition and actually leading us away from what it's actually meant to signify that this is 
Jesus's body that was broken for us. And let me just make this really specific for our listeners. I, I would argue that communion is symbolizing four things and we could add to it, but I'd say it's at least symbolizing these four things that uh, Jesus's death for us, that this bread and this red wine or juice pers- as you can already see with me, I, I don't, I don't think it's a problem of whether or not it's wine or not. I think the color of it's what matters. Uh, it's, it's red. It symbolizes blood. And that ultimately Jesus is going to die for us. This is what's happening in this meal as he's partaking with his disciples. It challenges us to examine ourselves, I think, and to, to see our standing before God and our need for reconciliation into the family of God. It also reminds us that we are a part of a family that we come to this table together and partake as a family in this meal. And then I think that there's an anticipation that a day is coming when we will all be gathered together around this family table. And so I would say that these four things, that this is what communion is symbolizing that is so significant around his body and blood. And I think the confusion of that, going back to what we were talking about with the the Roman Catholic um, view I mean, in the Middle Ages, the term hocus pocus actually originated from the Latin hoc est enim corpus meum, which means this is my body. And there was this idea in the Middle Ages that that was a magical phrase. It could turn bread into human flesh. And so it just developed into the kind of vernacular of hocus pocus being a magic word. And that's where kind of the misunderstandings can get out of hand. And that's where some of this clarification is important. Now, I actually would add to that, Andy, that I would contend that Protestants, historical Protestants, should actually believe in real presence, but not real presence in the way that a Roman Catholic would articulate it. And I would say that the idea of real presence from the Protestant perspective is the idea that the body and the blood of Jesus is present in the bread and wine, such that when we partake partake of it in the Lord's table, We're not just symbolically and subjectively remembering, but we are in some way truly participating in the spiritual act of the sacrament. So there's, it's not magic, but there is something special about this remembrance and participating. And I think it's important that it's done within the community of believers. So, and this is what the reformers argued as well, right? So for example, Luther is very emphatic about Jesus's words at the last supper saying, this is my body. This is my blood. And if you go and read, he has a sermon that he gave on John 6. He really takes issue with anyone emphasizing the symbol of the sacrament more than the spiritual reality of it. And that doesn't negate that Luther rejects the Catholic view of of transubstantiation, but that there's something that's special here that's not just like any other meal. That when we participate in it, there's something that goes beyond, hey, this is bread like any other bread, even though we would say in a very like uh, a very simple way, it is bread like any other bread. So there, there is, I think, in the idea of communion, there is this idea that we are in union with Christ, right? He, his presence mm-hmm. is there, um, especially there. there are a few views on that. There's the real presence view, right? So there's transubstantiation which we already mentioned there's consubstantiation which means that christ's body and blood are received in with and under the bread and wine whatever that means how that gets hashed out we're not exactly sure but there is i think the the, i think the distinction there steve that's just maybe helpful is it's a distinction between christ's presence in every way but physical would be consubstantiation whereas transubstantiation is is actually physical yeah. yeah. So that that's right. And then there's the spiritual presence view, which you know Calvin kind of held to, which is the idea that you know it, rather than focusing on Jesus's body coming down here, like he emphasized the role of the Holy Spirit, where um, he the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ and raises us up to Christ. So it's not necessary to bring Christ down to earth for us to be connected to. So those are kind of real presence views. And then 
a, a later kind of a reformer Zwingli, right? That the Swiss reformer, Swiss, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, he was yeah, so, Calvin's understudy. Right. So Zwingli, he had the more of the memorial view, which is more common in um, a lot of the Baptist churches or Anabaptist churches, like Mennonite Brethren, for example, uh, where the Lord's Supper is a memorial of Christ without necessarily that presence. But even there, I think, but in that active memorial, you are actually, you know, connecting, you're being connected to the history of all that has happened through Christ. So I think yeah. just to hold all of that together, I think there is this idea that in one shape or form, this is your union with Christ, right? In, in some way. And so yeah. I, I think there that's probably the key idea for me. That's the key idea. I, I want to add to it though, Steve, because I actually fear, I totally agree with you, but I fear that this is actually part of the problem is that, we see it from a very individualistic perspective. This is my right. right communion with Christ instead of this is our, our communion with that's Christ. That's exactly yeah. right. And so then yeah. in the communion table, you have two things happening simultaneously. One is that I, as an individual, am welcome to the table. But when I come to the table, we together are a part of the family of God. I, you know, I, I don't know what you guys think of this, but I would even argue that I don't think you can really be in union with Christ without being in union with other believers in, in us. Even if you, well, let, let's put it this way. What is salvation or what are we saved into, right? I think you've made that point over and over again, that we're actually saved into a community, right? In relationship with, with God and you're in relationship with other people. And so when you're, I, I, I don't think it's possible for you to be in union with Christ in a sense, like in a completely self-closed kind of a way, in a yeah. selfish kind of a way. I mean, the whole idea is you actually do, need to deny yourself, be in union with Christ and with one another. So I, I agree with you. Well, and I've said this to a number of friends who have kind of drifted away from the church and still articulate a belief in Jesus. And I say that like your 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 faith and your your relationship with Jesus may be very genuine, but it's a dangerous thing to love Jesus and not love what Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. And Jesus loves the church so much that he gave his life up for her. And that's why it's the body of Christ. And there's a danger in there is no lone wolf Christianity. It doesn't work like that. And so I, I would agree with you guys uh, 100% that this community aspect of it is so important. And it's why uh, more often than not, when we do communion in our church, which we do every Sunday, we do a corporate prayer because I think it's important that we, we confess as a group that, you know, there are there, we're part of this community and we want God to know that our sins, not just individually, but corporately um, are also important to be confessed. And as you mentioned, uh, Calvin, um, Steve, Calvin has this great line because Calvin is often accused of being like overly rationalistic in the institutes about a lot of things. But when he talks about communion, he has this great line where he says, I would rather experience the real presence than understand it. In talking about this mystery of saying, I don't, you know, he, he rejects the transubstantiational view, but he also says there's, there's a mystery to it that I'm not totally understanding. And when I come to the table, when I come into the life of the believers, when we participate in that act as a family, having this family meal, there's something beautiful about that, that I would rather experience within the body of Christ than try to parse out, okay, well, what's really happening with, you know, yeah. the, the, this is my body, this is my blood. Okay. I believe that I'm not going to pretend like I understand it. Let me throw, uh, I know we're coming in for a landing here, but I want to throw two things at you and get your guys' feedback on this one. Uh, this, this could be spicy. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> as I've thought about communion, I guess for me, one of the things that I think significant is I am very hesitant to get down the ritual path in the sense of, not that I have a problem with, with ritual, but I have a problem with uh, ritual that becomes repetitive and loses its significance, which I think can happen quite easily in, in this regard. So what would you, how would you feel if a church changed things up? I've never seen this, but I've often thought that this is, would be an interesting thing to do. If the church were to say, hey, why don't you celebrate communion as a family this Easter? 
and at your dinner table uh have the the dad go through you know the elements of what communion is and partake communion as a family or uh in your community group this this year take a time that you're going to celebrate communion together as a community group i would have to think about it um because i think that it is something that should be done i i don't think it would be wrong but ultimately i think in what we see where paul articulates the importance of the hierarchy of the church and particularly elders and the responsibilities that they have i would say the responsible thing would would be to have the elders administrating and administering the sacrament Although I don't necessarily think it would be inappropriate to do it in a like a, a small group setting, I would just have to try to think of how do we make sure that this is remaining what it should be without getting out of hand or becoming inappropriate or becoming like what I talked about before with the Doritos and the, the uh, Mountain Dew. Like <laughs> I would just want to safeguard things to make sure that it's what is happening is understood properly, that it's not being done inappropriately, and that everybody is on the same page about both, you know, the non-magicalness of it, but also the responsibility that goes along with it. I remember in, I took a, a Wesleyan class when I was in seminary, and um, John Wesley was very much uh, in favor of doing communion by yourself. And I did that a couple times at home, you know, went down, bought a bottle of wine and, and did it at home. And I just, it didn't feel right. <laughs> I <laughs> felt like there was something missing. I was like, okay, I'm reading Wesley. I see what he's saying. I see how he's articulating it. And I, 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 I don't like without going to a full critique of John Wesley, I don't think that that is what is outlined in scripture as to what this is exactly. It's interesting you should say that because I would have more of a problem with somebody partaking of communion alone than I would hmm. of the other two examples that I gave. What about you, Steve? Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, me belonging to an Anglican tradition, I, I I'm very much with Wes in terms of that kind of hierarchy, that appropriate administration of it and whatnot. But at the same time, there have been times when, you know, exceptions have to be made, like during COVID, for example, when we couldn't get to get all get together under the same roof. Uh, we had we received communion as a family just by ourselves. Um now, so my take on it is personally, like I, I would welcome that kind of a change, but at the same time, I would want to know that even as we're doing this separately as families, that we're doing it together, like it's a, it's a communal effort. So all the families are doing that each to his own family, but we're doing this together as a church at the same time. You know what I mean? Like I, I do. we're separate, but we're still together. And so I, I would still want to maintain that sort of togetherness in some way. Now my pushback, uh, particularly, I guess to Wes, but I, you know, and, and along with what you're saying, Steve would be, I agree with you that we need to make sure communion is being done in the right kinds of ways. And that, we have people that are uh, in leadership, if you will, uh, that are that are leading in that way. But then my question would just be, well, are you training up those kind of people? And shouldn't your community group leaders be the kind of people that you should call to a, to uh, appreciate what communion is and being able and willing to lead people in it? Yeah. Yeah, I think you should. And I think, but I think that there, there's like the multiplicity of elders is what I would articulate as the biblical position, um, pastorally in the sense that, you know, pastor is not a, a biblical word. We find these words, elders, overseers. So, but I think ultimately you should be raising up leaders within your church who can do things like lead small groups, right? And do so appropriately. Um, I would say that the sacrament might be something a little bit different, but once again, uh, I would have to think about it. And I think ultimately, if I'm being put on the spot here, there have been times in our church where the employed pastor, uh, we have a, a, a multiple elder community, which includes myself and another individual, and then the pastor who's, who's employed by the church. When he's been on vacation, I've been away, and Richard, the other guy, has been away as well. And so then we actually do have other individuals who would be leaders within our community administer the sacrament. So that has happened. And I think that it could happen within a small group setting. Um, I would just say communally, I think it's 
most appropriate under non-external circumstances to do during the service. And this this might just be an area where there's maybe just a little bit of disagreement between us, because I'm guessing with this next one that you probably part ways with. And I'm curious, particularly, uh, Wes, how you're going to answer this. But in at the church I go to, uh, uh, I go I go to North U Church. It's a Mennonite Brethren Church. And I've always appreciated the way they do baptism. They uh, allow anybody who's a Christian to baptize the person that they've led to faith or that they've had a significant influence in their life. So it, it's, in fact, it's rarely that the lead pastor baptizes anybody. Uh, mm-hmm. In my whole time there, I've maybe only seen it happen a couple of times. It's mainly those people that have either brought somebody to faith or have discipled somebody in the faith. So oftentimes it'd be a mom or a dad. Uh, it would be a friend uh, or it would be one of the pastors in the church. I think I have a less of a problem with that than I do uh, with the, with communion. Although I would say, ideally you would still want the elder to be doing it, but the, the baptism is the baptism for the person. Um, not for the person administering the baptism. Um, and there are whole historical controversies about this. Uh, my grandpa likes to say that the pastor who married him and my grandma is dead, so he doesn't know if they're married anymore. Mm-hmm. The power of the baptism is not in the person giving it. So I think in that sense, the confession of the individual and the baptism that happens is much more contingent on the person being baptized than it is on the sacrament being given in the same way as the Lord's Supper. So I would say, ideally, it's an elder <laughs> it's it, <laughs> doing the baptism, but I, I can totally understand why, say, a parent would um, it be appropriate for them to be involved or like a, um, a mentor or something like that. Do you that. know one thing I love about it, and I think it's the same reason I think I, I, I lean towards this idea of communion as well that I've already put forward, and that is that it raises that person to a higher standard saying ministry isn't something just that the pastor does but it's something that we've all been called to yeah i mean yeah there's a stipulation of the idea of word and sacrament there but as protestants we believe in the priesthood of all believers yeah right so in that sense the divisions need to be careful in not elevating the pastor or in um steve's case the priest as an anglican priest not like a roman catholic priest uh to a, a status that is inappropriate and above the congregation in a way that is just not biblical. Yeah. I, I mean, even when Luther abolished, well, he, he, it is said that what he abolished was not the priesthood, but the laity, right? Because we're right. all uh, priests in, in God's yeah. holy nation. And that's the idea. So anyway, I, I mean, this is, by no means an exhaustive discussion on this big topic of communion and sacraments, but hopefully viewers and listeners, if you're watching this, listening to this, hopefully this has whetted your appetite and perhaps my hope, I I don't know about you guys, but uh, my hope is that this has given you an opportunity to slow down and be more reflective about communion, especially if you take communion every week or once a month, whatever it might be so that we go into it a little bit more thoughtfully uh, and perhaps with more gratitude that we are able to do this with other believers and and commune with other believers and commune with God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So with all of that said, thank you so much for joining us this week on this edition of the AC Podcast. Um, The AC Podcast is a ministry of Apologetics Canada You can find us on all uh, major streaming platforms, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff to please our algorithmic overlords. And uh, (laughs) we'll come back next week with more stuff to think about. Until then, you know the drill. Love God. Love people. Bye for now.